Um, so anyway, so where, where were we? We were talking about um, when did you first get involved? Where, when did you first read the screenplay? When did Tom first approach you? Well, those are all different questions. Okay, when did, you, when did Tom first approach you? Or how did you first get involved? Uh, well, like I say, those are two very different questions because uh, the way I got involved is uh, there was a Columbia Journalism School case study yeah. uh, written about the Spotlight Team's investigation into the Catholic Church. Yeah. And uh, the guy who wrote the case study, uh, I mean, I uh, spent a lot of time with him, and uh, when it was finished, I, I uh, read it for him and critiqued it. And uh, his name, as I said, is David Meisner, and David is a novelist. Yeah. And he said to me he thought this would make a terrific movie, and uh, he knew a couple of producers who had optioned one of his novels. Yeah. And he asked me if I would mind if he uh, uh, sent the case study to these producers to see if they were interested. And by this time, it's uh, 2008. Oh, wow. And our investigation was uh, in uh, 2001 and 2002. Yeah. And so I said, hey, sure, you know, uh, knock yourself out. Uh, <laughs> never believing that this would actually be a movie someday. Yeah. And so, uh, so David did take it to two producers. Their names are uh, Nicole uh, Rockland and mm -hmm. Bly Faust. And uh, they ran with it uh, for a few years. Uh, wow. Uh, and they tried, uh, they had various uh, writers interested. They had one writer attached, but uh, uh, this writer really couldn't uh, attract uh, a good director or stars and never actually wrote a script. Yeah. And then uh, Nicole and Bly brought the project to Anonymous Content. Oh, okay. And that's yeah. when things started to take off because Anonymous Content put some money into developing the project. And specifically, yeah. they hired Josh Singer as a screenwriter mm -hmm. and they also hired Tom McCarthy to okay. direct. And, and Tom and Josh ended up co-writing the screenplay. And so um, it was after uh, Josh Singer was hired, it happened that I was in, spending some time in Los Angeles, and that's where Josh lives, and of course that's where Anonymous Content is. Yeah. So uh, I went over to Anonymous Content, and I met with uh, Mike Sugar and Steve Golan, and, uh, and then I met uh, for several long sessions with Josh Singer. And then uh, Tom McCarthy got involved maybe I don't know, six or eight months later, something like that. And, uh, and I happened to be in New York, and I had a very long lunch with Tom. And, uh, and then uh, Tom and Josh started to spend a lot of time interviewing other members of the Globe Spotlight team. There, yeah. were, there were four of us on the team, and there were there are two editors who are also portrayed in the movie. Yeah. And Josh uh, and Tom spent a lot of time with all of us. And by a lot of time, I mean many interviews lasting several hours each. Oh my gosh. Uh, so they spent the equivalent of, of days with us. It's almost like making a documentary. Yes, although it's not a documentary. No, 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 I, mean, I know it's, it's not a documentary. It's important to note that, and, and because it's, it's not a documentary. But uh, finally, at some point, they went off and wrote a script. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, you know, we weren't hearing from them anymore because they were off writing. Yeah. And uh, something like, uh, I don't know, eight months later, uh, they delivered a script to us yeah. and asked us uh, to read it and critique it. And I read the script and I thought it was uh, thought it was really brilliant uh, the, the way they just uh, weaved in so many complicated themes as well as uh, telling a complicated story in a way that felt uh, taut and uh, uh, quick and rhythmic and and uh, all that. So I was very very impressed with it. Uh, so then um, there were certain things about it, as I said, that uh, weren't as authentic as they could be. There were things that uh, I think were, uh, it's not a documentary, but I think there were things in it that were just unintentionally inaccurate. Yeah. And so uh, myself and uh, Walter Robinson, the two of us, uh, met with uh, Josh and Tom, and we spent an entire day uh, at the Globe in a... Uh, uh, conference room, yeah. uh, going over the script line by line, and just trying to get it uh, as authentic uh, and um, 
uh, true to the spirit of what we did as possible. Yeah. And it's a great credit to uh, Tom and Josh that they wanted to do that. They asked us to do it. We yeah. didn't say, hey, Tom and Josh, you know, we really want to go over this line by line with you and drive you crazy for, for 12 hours. Yeah. They came to us, and uh, I think it's a great credit to them that they did. And so we had a very long uh, creative day, and, uh, and so the script got uh, a lot better. Uh, but already, as I said, it was, it was a brilliant script. And, um, and then, as I understand it, uh, uh, Mark Ruffalo got interested. And, uh, you know, Mark is a wonderful, big-hearted guy who's a lot of fun to be around. And I think uh, other actors really like working with him. Yeah. And so once uh, Mark uh, got involved, then uh, the rest of the, this incredible cast uh, kind of came together. And uh, before we knew it, uh, they started shooting the movie. I mean, it, all of a sudden, a project that had taken years to get going and had many uh, false starts in terms of uh, financial backing, all of a sudden it just took off and things started to happen very, very quickly. And uh, was shot last year and uh, I came up for, uh, I made two visits to the, uh, the setup here. And of course, they shot a lot of it at the Globe and, yeah. and I tried to be around for all of that. And I spent a lot of time with Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. Uh, and he uh, captured me uh, perfectly. I think. So, so that's kind of a brief uh, rundown. So the first time that you saw um, that you saw this rough cut of the film, yeah, um, what was it like seeing Mark Ruffalo portraying you? It was very uh, strange. I mean, it was a very <laughs> strange experience, and uh, the people who saw the rough cut with me feel that he captured me uh, perfectly, like just perfectly. I mean, he did things that I didn't know I did. For instance, uh, uh, this is before we saw the rough cut. Actually, the yeah. very first scene that was shot yeah. uh, was a scene at Fenway Park. Okay. And uh, it's a scene where uh, Mark Ruffalo is talking about uh, the very initial stages of the church investigation. He's at a ball game with uh, an editor and a senior reporter, and they're voicing uh, great skepticism about the story. And, yeah. and uh, so, I don't even know how to phrase this grammatically, but I slash Mark were taking a lot of guff from, from these uh, other uh, more senior people at yeah. the Globe who didn't really believe in the story. And uh, there was a point where I was watching this shot with Sasha Pfeiffer, yeah. who was a member of the Spotlight team and is played by Rachel McAdams. Yeah. And Sasha Pfeiffer grabbed my arm and she said, oh my God, he's got your laugh. And uh, he, what she meant was he's got this sort of odd, uh, I don't know, little uh, breathy chuckle. And uh, I was completely unaware that I had this kind of, uh, this, this uh, almost a mannerism that's a, almost a tick. Yeah. So... Uh, wow, this guy has really studied me very, very well. He's picking up things that I don't even know about. So That was actually going to be my follow-up question. Did you learn anything about yourself, or did you see anything in yourself that you had never noticed before um, through Ruffalo's portrayal of you? I didn't notice anything that I didn't know before, but uh, it still was uh, a shock to see someone capture my, uh, uh, I don't know, earnestness, and in some scenes my uh, volatility, which is something... Uh, you know, I try not to show very often, uh, and actually tried to hide it from Ruffalo, but he picked up on it anyway, and because uh, he ends up, it ends up that he's such a good reporter, and uh, he also interviewed other people at the Globe about me. And, yeah. And so, uh, so he uh, he did such a good job that uh, I was I was really taken aback by how how uh, how accurately he did portray me, even sides of myself that I might not have wanted to show. How much time did you two spend together uh, before you guys started shooting, the, or before he started shooting the film? So, I mean, we spent s several days together at least, and uh, I mean, he came to my <clears throat> came to my home in uh, Winthrop, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, we spent uh, almost a whole day just sitting in my living room. And Mark showed up, and uh, first thing he did was open a notebook, and. Uh, so immediately the tables were turned. I'm usually the one opening a notebook and interviewing someone, yeah. but here's Mark Ruffalo in my home, and he's opening the notebook and interviewing me. And he also, uh, with his iPhone, he recorded my voice, and he, uh, he took photographs of my coffee table and my bookshelf, and, 
and uh, we talked about all manner of things, not just uh, the spotlight team and the story, but he wanted to know uh, why I'm an investigative reporter, and he wanted to know what my values are, and uh, why I've pursued this line of work for quite a few years. Uh, and, uh, and we also talked about other things, like our favorite books, and uh, our favorite movies, and uh, uh, I took him for a walk around the neighborhood. We went to lunch at a little Italian place on the beach near my house. And uh, and after, I think he left, I think it was 9 or 10 o'clock when he left. And then he spent uh, several days uh, shadowing me at the Globe. And uh, he sat right at my desk with me and uh, listened in as I took phone calls and interviewed people. And uh, uh, he got very interested in a story I was doing. I was investigating the deaths of some mental health patients at yeah. a state prison. And uh, I had video of uh, one of these men as he was dying in his uh, cell, surrounded by a collection of panicky nurses and prison guards and uh, doctors. And I was trying to see if uh, by viewing this very, very low quality video, I could uh, pick up on anything that might have contributed to this man's death. Yeah. And Mark got uh, so interested in this to the point where he, he took over the mouse. I have a computer, like I have a desktop with him. So Mark was taking the mouse and, and moving the, the video backwards and forwards. Yeah. And so uh, he just really got into it. Uh, and uh, of course, I uh, he took him around and introduced him to other people at the Globe. But we spent uh, several days together. And then, you know, I was on set a lot. And uh, during. Uh, and this, this surprised me, but uh, while shooting scenes, he would between takes, he would come over to me and ask me to uh, say certain lines for him. Really? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, I remember the first time, uh, at this very first scene we shot at Fenway Park, between takes, uh, he came over to me, and uh, I thought he was just going to give me a bear hug, you know, for, for the heck of it or something. Yeah. So he comes over, he gives me this bear cut, and he says in my ear, he says, how would you say this line? And so, uh, and so that would happen, you know, from time to time, you know, yeah. in between takes, he would ask me to say a particular word, you know, just how, how would I, just for emphasis, how would I emphasize a particular word? So he really uh, uh, impressed me with how hard he works and uh, his attention to uh, really minute detail as well as larger themes. Yeah. Uh, so I was uh, impressed with the guy, but we did spend quite a bit of time together. So how much were um, Sasha and your and your colleagues, um, the members of the Spotlight team and the two editors, how how much were they on set? How involved were they in this entire process and the, uh, the actors that were portraying them in the film? Yeah, we were all pretty involved and uh, we all visited the set and um, uh, the actors and the, uh, the crew, uh, all the production people, I mean, they were very, very uh, welcoming and uh, happy to have us around. I mean, I think we were touchstones for them. I mean, they were, I think, very, very excited about uh, two things. I think they were very excited about doing a movie that uh, really means something and has really mattered and, yeah. and, and uh, being part of a story that really changed the world, frankly. And I think they were also, and this surprised me, they were also very, very excited about playing real people. Yeah. And so uh, they liked having us around because they were constantly observing us and uh, studying us, even when we were having, maybe especially when we were having uh, very informal interactions. You know, yeah. they were really checking us out and uh, trying to uh, get from more information or evidence as to how to portray us in the film. So, so we were, uh, all six of us uh, spent time on set. I think Marty Barron, because he's uh, so incredibly busy as editor of the Washington Post, uh, I think he spent uh, the least amount of time of the six of us, but he was on set. And uh, I know that uh, Liev Schreiber uh, went to Washington uh, to visit Marty and spent time with Marty down in Washington. Uh, and uh, as I said, the others, uh, the rest of us uh, did spend a lot of time on set, but all of us uh, spent time, significant time, with the uh, actors who portrayed us. That's, that is amazing that you guys had such a close collaboration. You don't 
you don't hear about that that often. So, I, I mean, I, you frequently hear about these true stories that are told, and um, you know the, the people that are depicted in the film are like, the, you got this completely wrong. This is not this is not how it should be. That is what you usually hear, and I think one of the reasons uh, Spotlight is getting uh, raves everywhere is because of the. Uh, the work that the actors did in studying us and in the time they spent with us. And uh, I'm not sure I'd call it a collaboration, maybe that's what it is, but uh, uh, they really did their homework. And uh, not just their homework, but they really spent a lot of time interacting with us. And uh, I think it made a huge difference. Was it interesting having the tables turned on you, in a sense, by being the interviewee instead of the interviewer for a project like this? Yeah, it was. It was interesting, and it was a little unnerving at first. But I told myself, "Well, I deserve this." You know, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean I've spent uh, you know, a, couple, a couple of decades uh, putting people uh, on the hot seat and peppering them with questions. So I said, "Well, this is just some sort of uh, justice," you know. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting just to be on the other side of it and get sort of a better sense of what the people I interview are experiencing when I'm Have you changed talking. your interview style um, in any way, shape, or form because of this? No, I can't say that I've done that. I mean, I've been doing okay. this a while, and I, I no, I have, I have not changed the way I work at all. So. Okay. Um, and so going, going on to, um, many audiences know this story. Many people have read your work, um, and many people have heard about this story. Um, what do you feel that they can take away from watching a film like Spout? Like, what what can they learn from um, from something like that that they might not have learned from reading your work or hearing about the story in other sources? Um, what do you feel are the greatest takeaways from this film? Well, I think one great takeaway is, uh, and it's something we cannot do as the Spotlight team because we're, we're doing our investigations, but what this movie does, because it, uh, it, it puts us under the spotlight, so to speak, I think it makes a statement about uh, the critical importance of investigative reporting. Yeah. I mean, I can't go out, I mean, I could, but it's just not what I do, and write a story about uh, the need for quality investigative reporting. Uh, if I did, probably not that many people would read it. Uh, but to have a movie made like this, I think, brings uh, a, a lot of welcome attention to the, to the critical need for investigative reporting in a democracy. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a, a, a great accomplishment of the film. The other great thing I think the film does is it keeps uh, uh, attention focused on uh, the stories and the plight of uh, victims uh, or survivors of clergy's sexual abuse. And I think uh, that the work that has to be done on that issue is not uh, complete by any means. And I think uh, the church has made uh, some very admirable reforms, but I think uh, the church still needs to be held uh, accountable. And uh, I think the more public attention that's focused on this issue, the better. And I think the movie does that. I think it's a great thing. So as an investigative journalist, you've been an investigative journalist for a while, um, but I also saw that you went to the American Film Institute. Um, I did, yes. Um, and got a degree there. Yes. Um, what is, what's behind that? How did you go from um, American Film Institute into investigative journalism? Well, I'll tell you, I, I uh, worked at the Globe for many years as a political reporter. Yeah. And, uh, and I enjoyed it quite a bit, but I always... Uh, uh, Loved the movies and I uh, loved uh, fiction, and uh, you know I enjoy the arts very much. And so uh, I got to a point uh, at the Globe where I thought I should uh, uh, take a break and uh, just explore uh, screenwriting. Yeah. And uh, you know the truth of the matter is uh, I probably uh, would have pursued that for longer than I did if uh, Ben Bradley hadn't called me up one day and said, "Hey, do you want to be on the Spotlight team?" Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, uh, given the amount of uh, time I would put into uh, working uh, on screenwriting at the AFI, you know, you would think that would be a very difficult decision. You'd think it would be a major crossroads, and I suppose it was a major crossroads. But as soon as Ben asked me, uh, uh, I didn't hesitate. It was an easy decision to make. I knew, uh, well, first I asked him, I said, uh, well, who's, who's, he said it's going to be a new team, you know, new people. Yeah. And I said, well, who's on it? And he said, uh, Walter Robinson and a couple of others to be uh, named later. And I just thought to myself, wait a minute. Me and Walter Robinson and Ben Bradley in the same bottle? And I, <laughs> you know, it's one of the only times in my life where I've had this very strong, uh, very strong premonition. And I just felt that the three of us were going to do something big. 
Yeah. And uh, a year later, I was writing the opening story of the series on clergy sex abuse. That is absolutely amazing. That's amazing. How I agree. It, how it, how that just happened? It was it was almost like it was meant to be. I agree. I was in fact I was uh, I was trying to get uh, I, I left the AFI and yeah. came back to Boston and I was uh, trying to get back to LA and I was interviewing for a newspaper job out there and yeah. uh, and then Bradley called and said hey what about the spotlight team and I just thought <clears throat> yeah the spotlight team just as if, as if this is what you were meant to be doing. Yeah, but also, you know, I, I just consider the Spotlight team to be uh, the best and most important job at the Globe. And I considered uh, investigative reporting to be uh, a high calling, you know, the high calling of journalism. Yeah. Even though I loved covering politics and I was very, very good at it, yeah. uh, I felt investigative reporting uh, and do feel that it, that it is a higher calling. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I thought, well, this is a chance to really do something that's going to make a difference and it's really going to matter. And boy, I was more right than I even knew, even yeah. though I had no hesitancy uh, about saying yes, uh, and even though I felt strongly that, that uh, the three of us would end up doing very, very important work, I had no idea that we would do work of this magnitude. Yeah. So filmmakers, um, filmmakers and journalists are both held accountable in some way for telling the truth, particularly journalists. Journalists, yeah. people look to to tell the truth, but filmmakers sometimes will twist the truth to, you know, for their own means, for entertainment value, or something like that. How accountable do you think filmmakers should be to tell the truth? Well, it's, you know, I mean... And the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Filmmaking, uh, I mean, there, well, there, there are two kinds of filmmaking. There's documentary filmmaking, and, and then there's uh, uh, feature filmmaking. Yeah. And, you know, they're not the same thing. No. And uh, I think when uh, documentary filmmaking, uh, it's a lot like journalism, where there's an expectation that uh, you're going to be true to the literal facts. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, in a feature film, uh, there's uh, a lot more leeway as to how you can tell a story. For instance, in a feature film, uh, I, it's permissible to be true to uh, the spirit of what happened without being necessarily true to the uh, literal facts yeah and uh, so uh, there's a there's a I think there's a different standard for those two different uh, genres of filmmaking and yeah. obviously spotlight is a, is a feature film and uh, I think the reason for that is because they're telling the story of a five-month investigation from the points of view of six different people and if you wanted to make a documentary about that you know, it would, it would be a 12-hour documentary. Yeah. And so to tell it in two hours, I think, requires some uh, literary license and, as I said before, conflating of scenes, and uh, and that's what they did. But I think, uh, as I said, I think it's there, it's very, very true to uh, the, both the substance and the spirit of what we did. And I don't think, I know for a fact that none of us feel that uh, we personally have been exploited or, or that anyone's been exploited. I mean, I think... Uh, what they did was uh, isolate the very best, most important parts of what we did and uh, put those elements together in a narrative. Yeah. And so to close out, um, kind of a fun question, what are your favorite films? What, what's inspired you? Um, or what do you just pop on and watch on a Saturday night when you have nothing to do, if that ever happens? Well, I always go back to Chinatown as a favorite film, which is probably no surprise because Chinatown is a film about an investigation yes. of public officials. Yes. And, uh, you know, having spent a lot of time doing things like covering city council hearings and going through records of the Registry of Deeds, yeah. you know, I have a special appreciation for a movie like Chinatown where, which, which opens, if you've ever seen the movie. Oh, I've seen it many times. Okay, so it, it, you know, it doesn't open, I think it's the second scene is a city council hearing. Yeah. And uh, you remember when the farmers were bringing in their animals? Yeah. And of course, uh, the Jack Nicholson sort of discovers this scam yeah. at the Registry of Deeds. And so uh, I just had to love all that. And of course, the, the depth of uh, corruption that the movie portrays, I suppose, also hit home for me. Yeah. Uh, so, but I don't go home every Saturday night and watch uh, Chinatown. You know? But I, you know, I loved uh, The Sopranos, for instance. And yeah. uh, I'm a big fan of Ray Donovan. And uh, I really like Masters of Sex. Oh, 
I heard that's a great it's show. A, it's a great show, and so I'm fans of, I guess, uh, I loved uh, True Detective, and so, uh, you know, I guess I'm a fan of uh, what I think is a new art form, by the way, which is the, uh, the cable TV uh, serial dramas. Yeah. Uh, I think that they, they are like novels, the way these stories unfold. And uh, so I'm very interested in that. And, uh, you know, I'm a big, I'm still uh, quite an avid uh, moviegoer. So, yeah. So, uh, so I try to see, I, I usually by the time the Academy Awards uh, roll around, I've seen almost all of the films that are in contention. What have so. you seen recently that you've, uh, that you've enjoyed, that you would recommend that people go see? Uh, let me, let me, uh, I, I, um, I loved um, the Amy Winehouse documentary. I did as well. Yeah, I thought it was uh, very, very moving and um, just masterfully done. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's probably, uh, uh, that would be probably my number one uh, recommendation right now. Have you seen um, his, the director's last movie, Senna? No, I didn't. I have it uh, on my. It's in my Netflix queue, but I haven't seen it. It is. Is it good? Yeah, it's outstanding. Yeah. Not as not quite as good as Amy because Amy just hits you. Like yes. Those final ten minutes of Amy, I thought were some of the most crushing ten minutes of film I've seen this entire year. I could not agree more. I mean, I, yeah. I was I was sitting there in the theater, and you know, this movie just piles up and piles up over the two hours that it runs. And then there's that final ten minutes where you just realize what this young girl has become. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, I also thought uh, the influences on her life and those who may have uh, helped uh, precipitate her demise was also pretty uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I, I thought it was just uh, wonderfully done. I agree. Uh, so, anyway, thank you very much for sure. uh, chatting with me yeah. today. Um, this is uh, Mike Resendez, uh, subject of Spotlight um, at the Toronto International Film Festival, the movies and theaters on November 6th.